Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Dr. Marshmi Das. In today's video, I'll be talking to you about mucormycosis. Now, mucormycosis has been on the rise in the past couple of months in this COVID-19 pandemic situation. Now, why is that happening? How is COVID-19 and the treatment that we are giving for COVID-19 leading to patients becoming more susceptible to developing mucormycosis? Now, that is the question I'll be answering in this video. So starting with, what is mucormycosis? Now it is a very rare fungal infection, but when it is happening, it is very life-threatening. This usually happens because of a group of molds which is known as mucormycetae, and these are found naturally present in the environment. Now even when they are naturally present in the environment, it doesn't affect an immunocompetent individual. But if you are immunocompromised because of comorbidities like say diabetes mellitus, or you are having medications uh, which is making you immunosuppressed, you are more prone to developing mucormycosis. Now, first of all, we need to know how does this disease spread. So, the most common route of spread for this disease is by inhalation of the fungal spores, which then lodge in your nasal cavity and the first symptoms that you see are the nasal symptoms. Next, there is one lesser, uh, the less common mode of spread, which is through an open or a cut wound and if, uh, if the fungus enters through this, uh, through this root, then it will lead to skin infection. So this is about the mode of spread. Coming to clinical features, it's mostly rhino or vitocerebral symptoms and pulmonary symptoms. Now what do you mean by rhino or vitocerebral? Rhino means involving the nose or vito means involving the eyes and cerebral means involving the brain. Now the most common symptoms are usually involving the nose. So the first, uh, the most common and the earliest symptom that you note is nasal crusting. So the patient can complain of nasal crusting, nasal stuffiness, uh, unilateral nasal obstruction can be bilateral as well. Uh, the patient can be complaining of unilateral headache, paresthesia or anesthesia of a part of the face or swelling in the cheek. And coming to our vital symptoms, patient can complain of ptosis, proptosis, retro or vital pain. Starting with blurred vision, the patient can also develop total blindness in that eye. So these symptoms are usually the common symptoms that you have to look out for in a patient of mucormycosis. Next are the predisposing factors to mu developing mucormycosis. So the most common comorbidity that is involved in this disease is diabetes mellitus. Then other diseases that can be involved here are neutropenia or lymphopenia or a patient who has undergone an organ and bone marrow transplant or uh, if you have increased levels of iron in the body and this, this is because uh, iron helps in growth of mucormycetes in your body. That is the reason increased levels of iron is also a very high risk factor in developing mucormycosis. So these are the common ones and another one, another very important one in this current situation is over usage of steroids. So steroids as you all know can make you immunosuppressed and if used in high dosage and without any control of the dosage, early initiation of steroids in this COVID-19 pandemic has been seen to make you susceptible to developing mucormycosis. Now there is one clinical hallmark that you have to look out for. That which is tissue necrosis. Now mucormycosis is an angioinvasive fungus. So what it does is it invades the blood vessels, it blocks the blood vessels and hence uh, the, blood, uh, the blood supply to that particular tissue is stopped. As a result what happens is that tissue becomes necrosed and devitalized and you end up seeing necrotic tissue or black eschars or black crusting in the nasal and oral cavities as a sign. So now that we have discussed the clinical features and their high risk factors in this disease, we'll move on to how the disease happens, the pathogenesis of the disease. Now before that I would like to show you this picture. You can see the black crusting. This is an endoscopic picture of the nasal cavity. You can see the black crusting over here and this is how the disease manifests in the form of black crusts or necrotic tissue in the nasal and oral cavities. So now we move on to discuss in this current pandemic situation how is COVID-19 causing immunosuppression. So the first important factor in this thing is an inflammatory cytokine storm that is happening in COVID-19. Now what happens is uh, in this cytokine storm we see a rise in the ferritin levels in the body. 
Now what have uh, I already told you that mucor it requires iron to grow. Without iron it cannot survive by itself. So in cytokine storm we see an increase in the interleukin 6 which in itself gives rise to an increase in ferritin. Now because of this increase in ferritin we are seeing an intracellular accumulation of iron increasing and as a result of which there is free iron in the serum. Now this free iron is helping mucor to bind to it and starts growing. So this is the first factor in COVID-19 that is helping in mucor to grow. Second is lymphopenia. Now the COVID-19 has been targeting the T lymphocytes and as a result of which we are seeing a decrease in the CD4 and the CD8 cells which is seen in approximately 80% of patients right now and this leads to suppression of the immunity. Now because your immunity gets suppressed and if you have added comorbidities like diabetic mellitus and also you are having injudicious use of steroids while treating COVID-19, this can make you more susceptible to developing mucormycetes. Thirdly is endotheliolitis. Now what is happening, the virus here, the COVID-19 virus, it attacks your endothelium as a result of which causing a prothrombotic state leading to increase in thromboembolic events. At the same time, mucormycosis, as I said, is an angioinvasive fungus. Now, because it is angioinvasive, it is blocking the vessels, it is cutting off the blood supply to certain areas, and as a result, forming necrotic eschars everywhere. Lastly, COVID-19 is also seen to induce a diabetogenic state according to some recent publications out there. It states that viruses have been affecting the beta cells of the pancreas leading to insulin resistance and help, uh, helping in developing a diabetogenic state in the body. So this is also making you susceptible to developing, uh, developing mucormycosis. So these are the reasons how COVID-19 is causing immunosuppression in your body and helping your body in becoming more susceptible to mucormycosis. Next is how does diabetes mellitus uh, relate to mucormycosis. Why is it the most common condition that is associated with mucormycosis patients? So in diabetic mellitus patients, there is an impaired neutrophil function. So as a result of this impaired neutrophil function, this allows the mucor spores to germinate and invade the tissues. And because uh, the first invasion occurs in the nose, we see that the first symptoms are also seen in the nose. Secondly, we see in diabetes mellitus that is uh, you can sometimes land in diabetic ketoacidosis. Now in diabetic ketoacidosis what happens is there is a decreased binding of transferrin to iron. Now because there is a decreased binding to tra transferrin what happens is there is an increase in the level of free iron in the bloodstream and as, I, as you already know the free iron helps muco to grow in your body. Lastly, in diabetes mellitus, there is an increase in glucose-regulated protein 78. Now, what is this GRP78? This is a receptor which is found in the endothelium of vessels. Now, as I said, because mucor is angioinvasive, it goes and binds to, the, binds to this GRP78 and invades the vessels. And after invading the vessel, it cuts off the blood supply and leads to necrotic devitalized areas. So this is how diabetes mellitus is a key factor in developing mucormycosis. Next coming to steroid and mucormycosis. Now steroid, why are we using steroid in COVID-19? That is because it is helping in decreasing inflammation and helps us in dealing with the cytokine storm that develops in COVID-19. So if you add steroids and in a patient who already has diabetic mellitus and the patient is also having COVID-19, all of these three together is leading to an immunosuppressive state of the body. And because of this immunosuppressive state, you're becoming more susceptible, there is increased chances of developing mucormycosis. Therefore, it is a very important takeaway that steroids have to be used judiciously in COVID-19 treatment. Do not use in literally every case out there, do not use in mild cases, only use when it is absolutely needed and do, uh, do not start steroids early. You have to wait until day six for the cytokine storm to appear before you start steroids. So do not start steroids from day one of the disease itself. 
and also use steroids with proper monitoring of blood glucose. Do not forget that some people might be diabetic and even if you are not diabetic, you might be having uncontrolled blood level during this uh, current COVID-19 situation. So you have to make sure that you are having proper monitoring of your blood glucose while steroids are going on for you. Now, what, uh, since we are talking about the COVID-19 situation, who are the patients who are most susceptible or more the, who are most at high risk COVID-19 patients for mucormycosis? These patients would be patients who have uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, patients where a high dose and early initiation of steroids is being done, patients with prolonged use of broad spectrum antibiotics, lymphopenia, neutropenia patients, high levels of interleukin-6 and ferritin, and patients who are having tocilizumab use. Now the, in these high-risk COVID-19 patients, we have to make sure that we are observing them on a pre periodical basis and we have to refer to an ENT specialist for early diagnosis of these susceptible cases. Now, how do you diagnose this disease? If we see a patient is having excessive dryness or crusting in the nose or say there is anesthesia, parasthesia in face or all the other symptoms that I've spoken to you about in the post-COVID patient, it raises suspicion for mucormycosis, especially in immunocompromised patients. So in these patients, we should be performing a diagnostic nasal endoscopy. In a diagnostic nasal endoscopy, we could be seeing black eschars or black necrotic areas crusting or in the nasal cavity. Now, if after performing the DNA, you're still suspicious of uh, mucormycosis, we can go for a gadolinium enhanced MRI. This is the gold standard test right now for mucormycosis. In my mucormycosis, there is no role of CT scan at all in diagnosis. I'll be telling you now, why is MRI important? Now, MRI is helping in identification of the necrotic and devitalized areas. And why gadolinium enhanced is because ga when you give gadolinium to the patient, the gadolinium will be only able to reach those places where the blood supply is intact. So in the necrotic areas or the areas which are clogged by mucor thrombus, the gadolinium will not be able to reach there. And as a result, there will be no contrast enhancement of those areas. So you can easily identify from an MRI, gadolinium enhanced MRI, which are the areas which are not having any contrast enhancement. Those will be the area which are the devitalized necrotic areas. And these are exactly the areas that you have to do surgical debridement for. So basically, MRI is helping, in, helping you in identifying the areas which have already undergone necrosis and is differentiating you from the normal parts of the body. So what are the things you can note in an MRI? First is something which is known as the black turbinate sign. Now black turbinate sign is uh, because of the loss of contrast enhancement. You will see that the turbinates are actually the first structures to be affected by mucor. That is because turbinates are highly vascular structures in the nose. So if you see in this picture, you can see this. On the, uh, on the right side, you can see where the arrows are pointed. You can see this is the turbinate, which is totally black. Whereas on the left side, you can see these turbinates are having contrast enhancement. Whereas on the right side, you can see it has lost the contrast. It is because it has undergone necrosis. There is no contrast enhancement in this area. Secondly, we see perisinus inflammation, which extends beyond the sinus. You can see in the picture over here as marked, this is the perisinus inflammation, which is extending beyond the sinus. And thirdly, you will see that there will be a preferential involvement of the maxilla and the sphenoid bone. And even without, within the sphenoid bone, the pterygoid process and the greater wings of sphenoid will be involved. Coming to treatment. As we all know now, amphotericin B is the gold standard treatment for mucormycosis. But before you use amphotericin B, more importantly, you have to do surgical debridement of the patient. Now, why is surgery so important? It's because surgery, the role of surgery here is to remove all of the devitalized tissue and it will help in debulking of the infected tissue, therefore allowing faster action of the antifungals. So, first what we'll do is first we will be doing an MRI. Once we have done an MRI, we will be knowing all the necrotic areas in the nose that we have to debride. Once you know that, you can do a complete surgical debridement. And after the surgical debridement is over, then you start amphotericin B. 
Now once you have started amphotericin B, you see the patient is responding, slowly as a step down therapy you can shift over to posaconazole. But you have to remember here that surgical debridement is a key factor in the treatment of mucormycosis. If you have undergone incomplete debridement, then the fungus will keep on propagating. Amphotericin B will not be able to reach those devitalized necrotic tissue where gadolinium also itself has not reached. So that is the purpose for complete surgical debridement before you lead on to amphotericin B. Now coming to prevention of the disease, this is very very important right now. How do we prevent the development of mucormycosis? So as I already discussed all the high risk cases in this current COVID-19 uh, pandemic, those in those high risk cases like uncontrolled diabetes mellitus or immunocompromised states, you have to be more careful. So for the first important thing is a very strict glycemic control in diabetic patients. And even if you are not a diabetic patient, if you are undergoing steroid therapy, it is very important to have a very strict glycemic control. Otherwise, if, if, your, blood, if your glucose levels are very high in the body, and the sugar levels are high in the body, it will lead you to becoming more susceptible for muco to grow in you. Secondly, judicious use of steroids. Do not start steroids early. Do not start before the day 6th of the disease, which is in COVID-19. Do not start the steroids in mild cases or asymptomatic cases. Only use it when it is absolutely necessary. Third, you can use a saline nasal spray or douching for hygiene. And fourthly, there has been, uh, according to the European guidelines from Lancet, you can also use posagonazole as a prophylactic medication in these high risk cases. So the dosage would be to use a 200 mg posagonazole thrice a day. So these are all the things that you can do for prevention of uh, the disease. But most importantly, you have to remember the judicious use of steroids and strict glycemic control is key to preventing the disease. So, and also in these high risk cases, you have to keep a watch, you have to refer these patients to an ENT specialist because early detection, early diagnosis is the key to handling mucormycosis. Thank you guys, I'll be seeing you in my next video.